Good morning. morning. It's good to see each of you here this morning on the Lord's Day in the Lord's house. We are so delighted that you are with us this morning, that you have taken the time to come by to worship with us. And we, of course, also want to welcome those who are watching us online. We are so glad that you have logged in, that you've joined us in our time of worship, and uh, we really appreciate you being with us. Uh, Before we get started, just a few announcements to make for you real quick. And uh, uh, first of all, tonight, uh, the nominating committee will be meeting at 6 o'clock. And if you are on this committee, you should have already received notification of this. And so we look forward to meeting with you tonight as we kind of look forward to the next uh, church year and uh, getting things going uh, in post-pandemic the best we can, but also understanding that there's still a lot that's got to be done even with the pandemic on. So please plan on joining us tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, tomorrow night at uh, the home of uh, Chad Moore Liverman, they'll have their community group uh, experiencing life together in which they will uh, talk about today's sermon, expand that out, uh, have some questions and answers and discussions on that. So uh, if you'd like to be a part of this, just get in touch with Chad and Laura, get their address, and I'm sure they'd love to have you uh, in their home. And then on Wednesday evening, I'll be, be, I'll be starting a new study. This one is called The Christian Life, What God Expects from Believers. This is a four-part study, and we'll just be taking a look at various aspects of the Christian life, and we'll see what God has done for us and kind of what he wants us to do for him. Uh, So we invite you to come out Wednesday night to be a part of that. Uh, The plan is to meet in the parlor as long as this group is small enough and we can social distance. However, uh, don't let that be a deterrent for not coming. If you'd like to be here and our group grows, we will come in here to the sanctuary and we'll meet in here so that we can continue to social distance and yet meet together and have our discussions. Uh, other announcements are in your bulletin. We just ask that you take a look at those. And if you've got any questions, give the church a call office. Also, if there's anything that you need, anything that we can do for you, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. Let us know and we'd be glad to minister with you. Well, with that, we're going to get into our worship now. We're going to ask Kevin to come and he's going to lead us in our worship. I'm going to ask that you join with me this morning in song as we open our worship, our hymn. It's number 104 in your hymnal, O Worship the King. Let's stand together as we sing the verses. Yeah. 
Good morning. Well, as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, we certainly do want to continue to be praying for our nation. Uh, the Bible tells us that if we present our prayers, our requests, uh, our, our thanksgiving unto the Lord, that this is good, it pleases God our Savior, and uh, he will uh, certainly grant us uh, peace and tranquility uh, as we seek his will and his purpose uh, for our lives and for our nation. So let's go to the Lord this morning and let us uh, pray to the King of kings and the Lord of lords about whom we have already been singing. Let's pray together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Father, we know that this is a day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Father, though we may not always understand all of the events that are taking place in our nation and even in our world today, still, Father, we know that we can trust you with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all of our ways, acknowledge you, and you shall direct our path. Father, we pray for wisdom among our leaders today as we are commanded to do so in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We pray, Father, that they may be able to set aside partisan issues and, Father, come about with godly wisdom to direct this nation into a path that will bring about justice against injustice and peace against confusion and chaos. Father, we thank you that you are in control of all things and that we can trust you today. And Father, we pray that regardless of the circumstances around us, that, Lord, today our focus might be upon you. And that, Father, we might be encouraged. That, Father, our spirits might be uplifted. And that this morning, Father, indeed, we as the people of God might worship you in spirit and in truth. For we pray this now in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me share with you a little story real quick. Last week I mentioned some folks from up here on the pulpit and uh, that were watching at home. And uh, I got a card in the mail yesterday that uh, said, What a treat it was to hear our names on TV from the director of music. <laughs> And uh, the only thing better is knowing our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank Mary Jean Lyle for sending me that card and uh, appreciate her, her kind and uh, encouraging words. I'm going to ask you to join me in song once again. Our hymn is number 349, just a short little song. Oh, how he loves you and me, standing once again. Church. Good morning. Good morning. Are you
you happy to be in the house of the Lord? I know I am, praise God. I heard this song, I was thinking, talking to my wife about it the other day. I heard this song back in the 1960s when I went to, anybody here ever heard of the little town in PG County, right there on the D.C. border called Seat Pleasant? Nobody? <laughs> That's where my father's church was for, for years and years, on Addison Road there right across from the police department. There was a lady there, Mrs. Kennedy, an African-American lady, and I guess I was 16, 17, and she sang this song that I'm going to sing in a minute. I know who holds tomorrow. And I've never forgotten it. She did a wonderful job. And the song has always been a comfort to me, especially in stressful times. And heaven knows we have stressful times these days. Um, but uh, I hope this song will give you some comfort. I think, I'm trying to think of a verse. My hymn book doesn't have a verse, but um, I guess the best thing is Romans 8:28. What's that? All things happen for good to those who love the Lord and trust the Lord and do according to his will. And so that's what this song is kind of about. Verses Philippians 3 8. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Let's see. Jesus, 
and silver or gold I'd rather be his than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands I'd rather be And to be the king of a vast domain And be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world men's applause I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame I'd rather be true to his hope than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world. Amen. Praise his name. <laughs> Come on up here, brother. I'm good. One of the landmine there, isn't it? Thank you, Don, for leading us in worship through song this morning. And I'm a little jealous. He can play and sing. That's wonderful. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you will uh, turn with me to Psalm 100. We're going to continue in our series of messages this morning from the book of Psalms. And this morning we're going to be looking at the presence of greatness. The presence of greatness. Suppose you received an invitation to go to the White House. Suppose you received an invitation to go and visit uh, the Queen of England at Windsor Castle. Or suppose you received an invitation to visit the Pope at the Vatican in Rome, Italy. I mean, how would you prepare? How would you respond? How would you dress for such a very important occasion? Several years ago, when President George W. Bush was in the White House, the NCAA Girls Softball National Championship team visited the White House. And a picture was made of the team along with the president. And it wasn't long after that that some criticism was made about the way the girls were dressed. And the fact that many of the members of that particular team didn't even wear shoes, but were wearing shower thongs on their feet. And it was commented that such a great honor to be invited by the president to the White House should be responded to by dressing appropriately and uh, by, uh, by demonstrating appreciation for the opportunity 
to be in such a place of honor and respect. Well, this morning, I hope that we will see that we may not be going to the White House. We may not be going to Windsor Castle. We may not be going to the Vatican. But this morning, we are entering into the presence of someone far greater than the president, someone that is far greater than the Queen of England, far greater than any pope or potentate, on the face of this earth, as we come together today to worship and give praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. How should we respond in the presence of greatness? Well, in Psalm 100, we see a very small psalm, a very familiar psalm. As a matter of fact, I was reading this week and saw where one commentator said, next to the 23rd psalm, about the Good Shepherd, this is probably the most familiar psalm in the book of Psalms. And it explains to us how we should prepare ourselves and how we should conduct ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Notice with me, beginning in verse 1. As I said, it's a short psalm, so we'll read all five verses this morning. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. May God bless the public reading of his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we pray this morning as we enter into your gates, as we step upon your courts, as we recognize that this morning we are in the presence of the Lord. Whether those that are gathered in this sanctuary or those that are watching at home, the Father, we are in your presence today that you are watching over us, that you have called us and given us the great privilege of being your people, of being the sheep of your pasture. Father, may we learn today how we should respond to the presence of greatness, not only here this Sunday morning, but each and every day of the week. So, Father, wherever we go, Wherever we may be, we are in your presence. And Father, we thank you today for loving us and giving us the privilege of the breath of life and the honor of being in your presence today. We pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How should we respond to the presence of greatness. Well, really, in, in Psalm 100, although we have five verses, we, we really see three commands regarding our response to greatness. The first thing we should do is we should acclaim God's grandeur. We should acclaim God's grandeur. Whenever we enter God's presence, there should be an acclamation of the glory, of the majesty, and yes, of the awesomeness of our God. Look with me again in the first two verses of this wonderful psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. How should we acclaim the grandeur of God? 
Well, first of all, we see there is a shout. As a matter of fact, if you have the New International Version, you will see that this particular text begins not with make a joyful noise, but shout for joy to the Lord. Because the word that is used here in the Hebrew carries the idea of a shout, of a proclamation, of an announcement concerning the glory and the grandeur of our God. So when it comes to how we make an announcement with God, the first thing we see is, is there is to be an expression of joy whenever we speak about God. I think the idea here is somewhat like a, a football game. And the home team makes a touchdown. For those that are Washington fans, we'd say, we make a touchdown against the Cowboys. How do we respond? Do we yawn and say, oh boy, six more points? We say what? Yay, our team! <laughs> Well, that's the way we enter into the courts of the Lord. Yay! Our God! The God who loved us. The God who saved us. The God who called us. And the God who one day will deliver us into his glorious presence. How do we acknowledge this God? With shouts of joy. Psalm 66 Verse 1, shout for joy to God, all oh, the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. When we gather together on Sunday morning, one of the things that we should do is we should come with an attitude of joy as we express our appreciation to God for all that he has given to us, but also as we acknowledge the glorious person of God for who he is. You see, it's one thing to thank God for what he has done. It's another thing to praise God for who he is. He is loving. He is kind. He is gracious. He is good. We shout for joy as we celebrate the personhood of God. But I want you to notice with me, secondly, not only is there an acknowledgement of God through our communication about him, but we should also serve the Lord. We see here in verses 1 and 2, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Now again, some translations translate that term, worship the Lord. But really, those two terms in the Hebrew text are synonymous. To worship the Lord is to serve the Lord. To serve the Lord is to worship the Lord. That worship itself is an act of service to God. And whenever we are serving God, we are, in fact, worshiping God. You see, when it comes to the issue of worship, we need to realize that worship is not something that is passive. You know, today when we talk about a worship service, we think of folks coming together, church, sitting in the pew, and that's about as far as it goes. I mean, the pastor, the pastor preaches, the uh, music director, he sings, uh, these different people take a more active part in the worship service, but as far as the majority of folks there, they don't really do a, a whole lot else. Well, actually, when it comes to true worship, we see that we are all to participate in the worship of God. That's why congregational singing is so important. <laughs> it gives us all the opportunity to sing together, to worship together, to serve the Lord our God. 
in a few days, or really in a few hours this afternoon, the nominating committee will be meeting, and we'll be making calls and asking folks to participate in various positions within the church, maybe to teach Sunday school, maybe to do some other service within the church. Understand these are not minor issues. These are all a part of the worship of God. When you teach a Sunday school class, you're worshiping God. When you sing in the choir, you're worshiping God. When you welcome folks that are coming in the door, when you're taking their temperature, <laughs> You're worshiping God. Any act of service, everything that we do as we come together is an act of worship to our God. When we worship, we serve. When we serve, we worship. That's why the Bible says in whatever we do, we should do all to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, you see, there's no separation there. God didn't save us to be passive. He saved us to be active. God has saved us to be lights in a very dark world. He has saved us, not by good works, but for good works. I mean, if the only reason the Lord saved us is so that he could take us to heaven, Somebody would come forward on Sunday morning. they say, I want to be saved. They'd pray to receive the Lord Jesus, and they'd just drop dead and go to heaven. That'd be a real obstacle to evangelism, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough to get folks to respond. What does the Bible say? Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not of works, so that no one can boast. In other words, a person saved by grace, not by church membership, not by baptism, not by good works. But then verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're saved by grace through faith for good works. When we worship, we serve. When we serve, we worship. Listen to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but rather on a stand. And it gives its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, listen, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. And what will they do? Talk about how wonderful you are? No. But give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You see, service is worship. Worship is service. How do we acknowledge the grandeur of God? Through shouts of joy, through acts of worship, through service, and then also through singing. Notice again in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence, what? With singing. You say, well, I, I, I don't sing very well. Well, it didn't say he had to sing well. As a matter of fact, verse 1 said what? Well, make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. You say, well, listen, I, I'm not like Brother Don that can play the guitar and can sing so well. That's okay. God didn't say you had to play the guitar. God didn't say you had to sing well, but he did say what? Sing joyfully. Sing joyfully. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Listen, when we sit there with our arms folded and we just say, well, I'm not going to sing. My friend, listen, we're robbing God of the glory that he deserves. We're robbing God of the honor and respect 
that he demands. Shout unto the Lord with a joyful sound. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Now, it's important that we understand that this particular passage is not focused upon the skill of the singer, but rather it is focused upon the attitude of the heart. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. My friend, listen, if you've experienced the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that has changed your life, that has brought you from darkness into light, then you have no problem singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Listen, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you know him as your dear friend, then you have no problem singing what a friend we have in Jesus. When you've experienced the grace of God, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, you have no problem singing, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. You see, the focus is not upon the skill of the singer. It is the attitude of the heart. How are we to worship the Lord? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. But I want you to see with me, secondly, there's also to be an admiration for God's greatness. Look in verse 3. Know that the Lord... He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. We see in this verse that there is to be a confession about God. There is to be a recognition of the creation by God. And there is also to be an understanding of the calling to God. Now notice with me again in verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. Again, that, that Hebrew term in this text is the word radah. And basically it means to confess. It means to know who God is and to confess him with your mouth. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before my father, or if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my father who is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father who is in heaven. It's somewhat like that is, first of all, to know who God is. That's kind of an intellectual knowledge. But also to confess who God is with the mouth. Bible also says over in the book of Romans that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God is raising from the dead, you shall be saved. See the importance of confession. Knowing who God is and confessing who God is. You know, as we look in the Bible, we see many confessions about God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Through seven, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your houses. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. In other words, here it is. Here's, here's the confession. You know who God is, that the Lord your God, the Lord is one. That you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your might. And you confess him where? Well, you confess him at home. You confess him in the church. As a matter of fact, the Bible says you confess him wherever you go. 
But if you're going to confess him, you have to know him. And if you're going to know him, you need to know the truth. Confessions are important. You know, we used to have in the church what they called uh, catechisms, questions and, and answers, biblical answers to various theological issues. On well, my cell phone, I, I, uh, I have a, uh, a catechism, and uh, it's the Heidelberg Catechism, and every day it will ask me a question and gives you the answer to the question. The Westminster Catechism, the seventh question on the Westminster Catechism is this, who is God? Here's the answer. God is a spirit in and of himself, infinite in being, glorious, blessedness, perfection, all sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, all wise, most holy, most just, most merciful, and most gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. That's who God is. My friend, we need to know God, but we need to confess him. And we know him and we confess him based not upon emotions, not what I think about God, but rather what God has said about himself. When Jesus was questioned about worship by the Samaritan woman, she said, where should we worship God? The Jews say in Jerusalem, the Samaritans say in the mountains. And Jesus responded and said basically to her, listen, the issue isn't where you worship, it's who you worship, how you worship. He said, the Father seeks true worshipers who will worship him, how? In spirit and truth. Where do we learn the truth? Jesus said in his high priestly prayer to the Father, thy word is truth. My friend, we come to know who God is, how to worship God, how to know God, how to serve God. How? In the Word of God. The Bible. Listen to what the Bible has to say about who God is. Notice with me, secondly, not only a confession we see in this verse, but also an understanding of the creation. That we are not here by chance, but the reason that we should worship God in spirit and in truth to confess him as our Lord is because he is the one that created us. He is the one who made us. That we are not here by chance. That we are not an accident. But rather we are here today by divine appointment. That before the very foundations of this world were laid by God. God chose us to be here. In Psalm 139, David says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My son knows, or rather, my soul knows this full well. In other words, David said, listen, God, you're the one that made me. You made me how I am today. You made me in the times that I live today. I am who I am. I am where I am because of God. He created us. The Bible says he created us in his own image. If we're going to worship God, if we're going to express to God, the honor and respect that he deserves, we need to understand that it is God who created us. It is God who put us right here today. We're not here by accident. We've been created in the very image of God. God has a purpose for us. You know, that's why evolution, is so anti-Christian. 
That's why evolution is, is so anti-biblical. Well, so it says we're all here by chance. We're just mistakes. Richard Dawkins, a well-known evolutionist and atheist, he stated in one of his books that there's nothing really special about man. As a matter of fact, all we are is a walking bag of fluid for viruses and bacteria to grow. Man, he doesn't have a very high view of you and me, does he? <laughs> but let me share with you how inconsistent that is. If that's true, Richard Dawkins would never go to the doctor because, listen, when he gets sick, he's fulfilling his purpose. He's just a bag of fluid for viruses and bacteria to grow. Any evolutionist today that's wearing a mask because of the virus is a hypocrite. Why? Because evolution says survival of the fittest. We ought to be glad we have a coronavirus to wipe out the weak. That's the evolutionist point of view. Don't let an evolutionist tell you, well, the church is full of hypocrites. My friend, the university is full of hypocrites too. <laughs> At least we don't charge to come here. Listen, the Bible says we're not a mistake. We are created in the image of God. That's why the issue of racism is foolishness. Why? Because it doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter what your nationality is. You were created in the image of God. And you were worthy of dignity and respect. Let me take it a step further. It doesn't matter if you're born or still in the womb. You're created in the image of God. And you are a person of value. That's why abortion is wrong. That's why racism is wrong. Because we have been created in the image of God. We come into his presence. We confess the truth about God. And we worship God. Because he is the one who has created us. But not only that, we see he also is the one who has called us. Now, God has created everyone, but that doesn't mean that everyone is a part of the family of God. As a matter of fact, when Jesus confronted the religious leaders of his day, he told them, he said, your father is the devil. <laughs> and you want to do the works of your father, who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that to as many as received him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. You can't become something you already are. I remember sharing with a lady one time the gospel, and I asked her, I said, how long have you been a Christian? She said, I've been a Christian all of my life. I said, that's too long. <laughs> Listen, you... You're not born into this world a Christian, but the Bible says you're born again when you become a Christian. Jesus said to Nicodemus, a religious leader, you must be born again, that you will never see the kingdom of God if you haven't been born again. You see, God created us, and God calls us to be a part of his family, to turn from our sin to receive Christ and to know Jesus is our Savior, God is our Father, and heaven as our home. That's what it means to be called of God. I believe that's what the psalmist is talking about. He says, listen, it is God who's called us to be a part of his family, to be the sheep of his pasture. If you're going to worship God in spirit and truth, you have to know God as your heavenly Father. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except how? By me. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone may say, well, that's narrow-minded. I don't know if it's narrow-minded, but it's true. Well, how do you know it's true? Because Jesus said it. <laughs> and he is true. I want you to notice with me thirdly this morning and, and finally as we look down the last two verses of this passage. There's to be an appreciation for God's goodness. Look with me in verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving 
and his courts with praise. Most commentaries that I've read believe that this psalm was, was actually written sometime after David had, had, uh, had died. It is not written by David, and one of the reasons for that is because it, it talks about the gates there would have been at the temple. And it talks about the courts there would have been at the temple. Some believe perhaps Isaiah may have been the one that God used to write this wonderful hymn. Whoever wrote it, whenever it was written, it tells us, enter his gates, how? With thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord, listen, the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Listen, every child of God, regardless of the circumstances, we ought to have an attitude of gratitude for the goodness and the gifts of God to us each and every day. I mean, you may be sitting here this morning wearing a mask, but my friend, listen, at least you're sitting here. God gave you this morning the breath of life. He didn't have to. He doesn't have to give you the next breath. Every day, every day is a gift from God. As we look in the Psalms, we, we see the theme of thanksgiving is repeated probably more than anything else. For example, Psalm 97, verse 2, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. Give thanks to his holy name. Psalm 107, verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 118, verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love, again, endures forever. Psalm 136, verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good. Are you getting the message? For his steadfast love endures forever. You know, when I was growing up, if mama told me to do something once, like take out the trash, that was kind of important, but I usually didn't pay attention. Man, by the time she got to three or four, that means it was time for a whipping. <laughs> I mean, that means I better take out the trash. Well, when we look in the Psalms, we see not just three, not just four, not just five, but repeatedly give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he is good. <laughs> His steadfast love endures forever. You know, most of us probably have a, a, a computer. We have a computer at home or at the office and you know, when you tur first turn on the computer, what does it ask for? It asks for what? It asks for a password, doesn't it? And, and if you're like me, you try to use the same password no matter what you're on. Be because, you know, you've got kind of a limited memory. Well, notice with me in this passage, when we come to the gates and we're asked for the password... What is the password? I'm going to give you a new password for your computer. The password is thank you. The password is thank you. Listen, enter his gates, how? With thanksgiving. Thanking God for his goodness. Because his steadfast love endures forever. Thanking God. For all the wonderful and unappreciated things he does for us each and every day. We thank God because of his provisions. James 1 verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes where? From above. It comes from God. It comes from God. You say, well, everything I have I've worked for. Let me ask you, who gave you the good health so you could work? Who gave you the intellectual ability? 
so you could do your job. I'll tell you who. The God that created you. We thank him for his pardon. Listen, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives you of your iniquities? He forgives us of our sins. You know, I read the other day where they're, they're taking down you know, statues in, in, in the Capitol. And they're taking down some pictures of uh, those individuals that served in Congress for one reason or another because of, of things they did in their life that were wrong. You know, if they took down every picture in Washington of everybody that did something wrong, there wouldn't be any pictures in Washington. The Bible says, for all have what? Sin. That means your picture wouldn't be there, mine wouldn't be there either. Because we all fall short of the glory of God. My friend, that, that's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why Jesus shed his blood. In order to provide for us an atonement. The means of forgiveness for sin. We thank God because of his pardon. We thank God because of his presence. He's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. As a matter of fact, He has His Holy Spirit living within us. We thank God because of His preparation. Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, that where I am, there you may be also. We thank God. For his goodness. We thank God. Because of his everlasting love. You know I began this sermon by asking the question. If you received an invitation to the White House. If you received an invitation to the Queen's House. If you received an invitation to the Pope's House. How would you respond? Jesus told a parable in, John, or in Luke chapter 14. And it was about a king that sent out invitations in his kingdom. And he sent those invitations to people of importance. Those who were officers and leaders in the kingdom. And they all responded the same. Well, I'm just too busy. Or I got to do this. Or I got to do that. So the king told his servants. He said, you go out to the highways and the byways. You go out on the street. You go down the alleys, the back roads. And you tell all those that you meet, they're invited to the king's house. And we will fill my banquet hall. My friend, listen. We have an invitation. Not from the president, not from the queen, not from the pope, but from the God of heaven. An invitation to come into his presence. An invitation one day to live in his heavenly kingdom. The question is, are we going to respond to that invitation? Are we going to receive that invitation? Or are we going to say, not now, Lord, I'm just too busy? You see, the choice is ours to make today. The invitation has already been given. How are you going to respond to the invitation? Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> My friend, listen, if you've never received Christ, if you haven't responded by receiving the invitation. Why not do that this morning? Just pray with me right there where you are and simply say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. But Lord Jesus, I believe today you died for my sin on the cross. And I ask that you would come into my heart and forgive me of my sin and be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me today. Give me the courage, I pray, to tell others about you. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you made a decision for Christ today, why not bless our hearts? We're going to have a brief invitation, give you an opportunity to respond, to make this morning a confession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'd also ask, listen, my friend, if you know the Lord Jesus, if you've never been baptized, it's not baptism that saved you any more than good works that saved you. But if you know the Lord Jesus, listen, we have been saved for good works, to do good works. One of the ways that we confess the Lord Jesus is through baptism in water. If you've never been baptized by immersion, we'd encourage you to come this morning. If you're not a member of a church in our area, and uh, you're looking for a church home. We would encourage you to come this morning as we stand together and sing. Kevin is going to lead us in our invitation. You come as we sing. Kevin. Ask that you sing and join me in our closing hymn this morning. It's number 193 in your hymnal. God is so good. God is so so much for being here with us this morning. I want to thank those at home who have joined us this morning on the uh, internet. I want to encourage you all, if you can, come back and be with us again next Sunday as we meet for the first Sunday in August. It's hard to believe we're already in the month of August now, but as we are going through these hot summer months, uh, let me remind all of you, it's another reason to give thanks unto God for air conditioning here this morning. I uh, know there are several churches that are still meeting outside, and I'm kind of like, well, is your air conditioner broke? Why are you doing that, you know? But uh, we're so glad to have you all here this morning. We certainly want to continue to keep in prayer those that are not able to be with us for health reasons, and of course, to continue to be praying for our nation today, and to be praying for those that are in the hospital that are dealing with this virus. It is good to know that our God is aware of our situation and our circumstances, and it is good to know that our God is so good to us. May the Lord bless you. May his grace and peace be upon you. May he guide you in the days ahead until he brings you safely once again to this place where you can worship and serve our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father God, again, we acknowledge your goodness. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of being in your presence today. And Father, now as we leave this place, may we leave realizing we are not leaving the presence of God because wherever we go, at home, at work, wherever we may be, we are still in the presence of our God. And Father, we thank you today that you have promised never to leave us nor to forsake us. And that, Father, you watch over us. And Father, we certainly pray that we will look for every opportunity that you bring our way to share your goodness and your love and your grace with others. For we pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.